Okay. Hello. Congratulations, Jean-Francois, on such a charming and beautiful film, as well as for recently picking up the jury prize for Best Canadian Doc at Hot Docs Festival. This is such Merci. a wonderful film. <laughs> this is such a wonderful film of, about loss and longing. Um, from the outset, it really seems like a simple film about just lost items on the metro, um, but you weave in a much larger meditation about life and loss into your film. Um, what is it that inspired you to make this documentary? It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, well, in, in uh, all of my previous film, like I, I, I do documentary films because it's an excuse to, to uh, reach out and jump into other people's lives. But I need, I need a question. I need like to be on a, on a quest. And I, I thought that uh, the lost and found object would be a very good starting point. And yes, I wanted to deal with the question of like longing to find something back, but to start with something material and slowly go to something more immaterial. Mm. And uh, this is how it started. And so you, but not all the characters in your film actually lost items on the Metro. Um, is that no, we also went on Kijiji to see there was a lost and found uh, rubric. And we we uh, we went there too to find some of the characters. Wow, how yes. did, how did people respond? I was curious actually. I'd been speaking um, with some other folks who'd watched the film about you know when you were filming people at the counter um, at the STM at the Metro. Um, did people? I'm assuming people knew that you were filming them, or did you just set up a camera during the day and then approach people after? They knew, and uh, at the beginning we like they. They're lining up, so we were asking them, oh, uh, we're uh, making a documentary film, and it's about loss, and uh, can we please uh, film your interaction with the employee? And uh, we would also tell them that we might phone you after that and follow you in your life, if you agree, of course, uh, in the winter, uh, maybe doing outside activities, or um, having dinner with friends, like we, uh, that's how we, we approach the people. And then I would look uh, at the material because we, we shot only two days at the STM in this very small office. And then I, we looked at the uh, interactions with the employee and we picked maybe 30 people and we, we contacted them and we, uh, we tried to follow them in, in, in their, uh, in their winter, cold winter nights. It was, yeah, it was incredible. Like, I really loved how you managed to connect so, um, just so deeply with some of the characters. You know, some of the scenes that I really loved was um, the scene with the, the young people, like talking about love and heartbreak. They were sitting on the couch. Um, and then also there was that scene with the fellow who, um, who had had HIV and then his partner had also unexpectedly died from HIV and he, you know, he had lost so much in his life, but yeah. um, he was like so poetic and giving in his answer. Was it really hard to coax people to share so much? Uh, it was like, of course, it's like, it's, it's many steps that led to these big intimate scenes. Like uh, the first meeting with them, it's at the SAM at the Lost and Found. Then we would go for... It's interesting because in my other films, I, I, I try to avoid interviews, but in this one, I felt I have no choice because if I want to discover their world, uh, if I want to discover these people, I have to invite myself with my crew to their place and do something more formal, an interview where we would really talk extensively about the lost object and at one point shifting towards more immaterial loss. So there was the interview, but then there was like another night where we would do something outside with them. And there would be also maybe a fourth meeting where I would say like, just invite your friends, your family, have a drink with them. And is it okay with you? And, and, and it's interesting because they would become my ambassador, you see, because I would invest them of my questions because I had questions about loss. And, and at the dinner, like the first two hours, it would be a normal dinner. And, suddenly they will start to 
Well, I would give them a cue and they start to, uh, to ask some more difficult questions about loss. So it's, I think it's because there was many steps that they became, they, they started to know the crew and they started to be more and more comfortable. Mm. Yeah, it's impressive because- Yeah, I don't think the first day we would have got that, uh, these kinds of uh, very intimate uh, confidence. I don't think we would get that on the first meeting with them, but because there was three, four meetings, three to four meetings, then things like this happen. Yeah, I think it worked really well. Yes. It's very natural. Um, mm. People seem to be sharing things, especially in the group settings. It seems so natural. Yes. So, yeah, congratulations yes. on that. But in every group setting, there's always one person who is like invested of my questions, and that's I, it's the first time I tried that. But I really, I really enjoy that. Um, I should have asked: Have you lost anything significant on the metro yourself? Of, um, like, I really hate to lose something. Of course, like, uh, I, I always, um, every winter I will lose a scarf, I will lose a toque, I will lose uh, uh, gloves, uh, but I, uh, for me, it's like an alarm signal about my life. If I start to lose too many things in one week, it's like something is going wrong and uh, I have to talk to my psychologist or something like <laughs> It's I hate to lose things, and uh, but I, I I often reminisce uh, times that I've lost, and and I'm I'm often in nostalgia, so maybe that's why it's a a, a, a topic that I wanted to explore because mm -hmm. I I often reminisce like uh, uh, past uh, love stories or like uh, I don't know past moments, but I, it. it it seems that I cannot enjoy things when they happen. And I, I will rediscover these parts of my life when it's over. I'm deeply nostalgic. <laughs> that's why the film is in black and white. That makes sense. I think that's why I connected so much as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very well done in that way. Um, at the end of the film, you brought a lot of the subjects together to perform this song. Yes. What was it like for them to meet one another? It actually was just, you know, a very brief chapter in the film, but... Yes. Um, how was uh, they were so focused because I met this amazing uh, guy, André Papatomas, and I went to see a show and he's actually someone, his, his process has similarities with mine because he really wants to go out and meet anybody and and make something out of the voice of anybody. And he made us sing our first name. And I was with one of the people and we all sang our first name and he directed us. And suddenly it sounded really like mod, like modern, contemporary, modern classical music. It was like, it, it's, it was amazing the result that he had. So after that night, I, I, I met him and I asked and I told him about my project and I told them that I would, want people to sing about something they have lost and he made that that miracle happen and and they he, he rehearsed so much with them before and to train their voice and we had like it's just like one evening of one night of shooting and he so they didn't really interact with each other because they were so absorbed with the like the first three hours were just a practice with andre and then he made them perform and, and well we shot everything we shot the practice but what's in the film is really the, when they perform. Mm. It's so neat. I mean, music mm. plays such a large role in the film. Do you want to talk about um, the- Well, the um, yes, I, uh, I work with, uh, with a composer who is actually a young music student. Uh, he, he was, uh, it's a Swiss uh, musician. He's a jazz musician. And I wanted jazz because it's a reference to these films in the 60s with the, black and white and jazz music, like we have Gilles Groux, Le Chat Dans Le Sac, but Cassavette has, has put some jazz also in, uh, I think, Faces. And uh, you have also uh, Louis Malle, who, who uh, uh, Ascenseur Vers l'Echafaud, has put some kind of good jazz music. So I wanted jazz music. And uh, I had in mind uh, something that it's, it's, a, it's called the October Trio. It's a Vancouver band, and they they uh, they made a 
an amazing version of Bjork. Uh, you've been flirting again. But Bjork and our entourage didn't want us to use that piece. So I asked this young composer to come up with something, but I didn't want, I wanted him to feel really free and not to, to give me something that would sound like uh, October Trio. But I said, I want a clarinet. That were my only constraint. I want a clarinet, I want a bass, and I want a drum. And you do whatever you want, and you try to come up with a, a leitmotiv. And I showed him some pictures of the film. And, and uh, his name is Tom Brunt, and he came up with this wonderful music. But what I thought was amazing, but it, what I thought was really uh, interesting is that with my editors, we decided to abandon the leitmotiv at one point and go for something else, but, but completely still in the nostalgia, like a, a Felix Leclerc song that uh, is actually about a scarf and the scarf becomes the symbol of a relationship. And also an amazing piece by, uh, I never thought we could have the money to buy the rights for, to use that song, but it's, it's my favorite group of the 80s. The, uh, their name is uh, Trisomy 21. And that piece is called La Fête Triste, like the sad party. And it's just this amazing instrumental uh, piece that is a bit sad and, and, and that is charged with like the feeling of a sad party. <laughs> so, but I, I like that we, we, we had a, some kind of a recipe with the jazz music and suddenly we, we, we were free from it. And it's really like in the editing process that we, we decided to add other music. Mm, it works so well together. I mean, that and the setting, um, which I'm curious to ask you about, just the winter in Montreal, yes. it really felt so magical. And, and I have been to Montreal in the winter. And I, you know, I think similarly to Manitoba winters, they're also yes. you know, they're challenging winter. They're challenging. They're challenging. They're very you chose to set the film specifically in the winter, though. Do you want to talk about why that is? Yeah, and I underestimated the challenge because uh, it was so hard for my crew. It was like my most challenging uh, shooting. Uh, it's my fifth feature, and it was like really tough uh, because also the people I'm used to work with, very generous people, but people are less generous when when it's cold outside and they want to get back in and, and we need to do another, <laughs> try some, we want to do another take and they're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm fed up with this and I, I want to get back inside. And, but I, yeah, I, I wanted to show Montreal's winter. For me, it's a very challenging season uh, because it's humid and it's cold. And I wanted to show that, but I wanted to show the, the snowstorms. And I thought that in a snowstorm, because this is, this is a film about loss, I thought in a snowstorm, everything is covered by snow. So we have this feeling that everything is lost. So, and, but I, on paper, it sounded very nice. But when we had to shoot these scenes, like we, we shot four snowstorms. You, what you see in the film is actually the result of like four big snowstorms in Montreal. We were lucky that there was so many that year, and but it was such a challenge, and we broke equipment, and we had like all kinds of logistical problems uh, because of these very extreme conditions, like like trying to park the van at 4 a.m. after a long night of shooting and not not finding a spot in Montreal. <laughs> uh, I was the chauffeur, by the way, so that's that's why I. <laughs> That's why I remember this so vividly. Um, this might be a good place to end unless you have anything else to add. It was, again, it was, I found it such a charming film and I hope that our audiences do too. And um, yeah, I'm so glad that we could screen it. Merci, Viviane. I hope that, uh, yes, uh, I wish a good, uh, a good festival to everybody. And uh, I hope the people will watch a lot of your uh, the films that you've programmed